First Thessalonians, we're going to look at the first, probably the first 10 verses of chapter 5, but I'm going to read two verses so we can build off of these two. So First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 5 and 6. If you have your Bibles, why don't you go ahead and open up your Bibles. If you have your iPhones, iPads, whatever you use, make sure you have the Word of God in front of you. Amen? First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 5 and 6. Those of you online, make sure you get your word out and follow along this morning. Amen? Verse 5 and 6, it says, For you are all children of the light and of the day. We don't belong to darkness and night. So be on your guard, not asleep like the others. Stay alert and be clear-headed. One writer said this. He said, the two greatest purposes of the prophetic word, and 1 Thessalonians is a prophetic word. It's a prophetic word to the church about the end times. How I many know we're becoming an end time church? That's what Paul was instilling in the Thessalonians. The two greatest purposes of the prophetic word is to call people to holiness and to call people to repentance. The church must come back to holiness. Tell your neighbor you got to be holy. Amen. You got to be holy. Right? This morning, Paul the Apostle is telling the church in Thessalonica simply to wake up, to wake up. He says, we're, we don't belong to darkness. I mean, when you go to sleep, you turn off the light. Can I hear you say amen? You turn off the light. You're in darkness. But how many know the church doesn't belong in darkness? We're not to live our lives in darkness no more. Right? He says, we don't belong to darkness and light, so be on your guard, not asleep. Tell your neighbor, don't sleep like the others, but stay alert and be clear-headed. He's talking to us today, and I put a title on this, and I called it the woke generation. The woke generation. And the reason I titled it the woke generation is that's a word that has become very popular in the last couple years. You need to be woke, right? And it's a term that people use nowadays, and according to the Urban Dictionary, this is what it means. It means to know what goes on behind government doors, to be woke. To know what goes on behind government doors, or to be alert to racial prejudice, and to understand the real world right you hear people talking about we got to be woke we're woke I asked some of our young adults because I want to make sure I get it right so I asked a few of our young adult uh, adults what it means to them and one of them says that it means you're on point you're up on what's going on and you're ready I like this one you're ready for whatever right another one says it means to be alert or aware of important facts or issues. And it's usually about a social justice issue. Tell your neighbor, you gotta be woke. You gotta be woke. Tell someone, you gotta be woke, right? But did you know what else I found out? I learned about being woke. Being woke originated in the Bible. It isn't nothing new. It's nothing new. Paul the Apostle encouraged the church in Thessalonica. He encouraged them to be woke in regards to the end times. Church, we need to be aware of what's taking place in the end times. We need to know what's going on in these last days can I hear somebody say amen? He admonished the Christians. He admonished them to stay awake and alert 
concerning the coming of the Lord. Now, I ask you guys this every week, but I want you to be honest. How many of you, at least once this week, thought about Jesus could come back soon? Come on, raise your hand if you really thought. If you're not putting up your hand, something's wrong with you. You need to have that thought. You need to have that fact. You need to have that knowledge on your heart on a daily basis. Because Paul the Apostle, he's telling the church, the church needs to be awake and alert concerning the coming of the Lord. Jesus is coming back soon. Say that with me. Jesus is coming back soon. He's coming back soon. Now, it's not about guessing the date, right? It's not about guessing the time that, it's, that he's coming. But here's what it's about. Here's the fact that Paul is trying to get across to us. He's trying to get this fact across to us that we have to live right from this day forward. You and I have to live right until Jesus comes back. He said, be on your guard. Be on your guard. That's a military term. Those of you that have ever stood watch on guard duty in the military, you'll know that it's not something to be taken lightly. You don't fall asleep when you're on guard duty. Because if you fall asleep on guard duty, you could be court-martialed. And in a time of war, you could actually be given a life sentence or a death sentence for falling asleep on guard duty. And that's the term Paul is using to the church, to us today. He's instructing us as soldiers in the army of God to be aware and to be alert to our surroundings. You got to know what's going on around you. Tell your neighbor, you got to be woke. You got to be woke. Because the Bible tells us that in the last days, many people will be deceived. They'll be deceived. Peter encouraged the Christians he wrote to. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 8. Look at what he says. And I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. He says, stay alert. But it, it's not like, hey, stay alert. It's like, stay alert with an exclamation point on it. Stay, in other words, something that would shock you and wake you up. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy. How many know, church, we have an enemy? It's not a brother or a sister. It's not your leader. Come on, somebody. We have an enemy, and, and Peter says he's a great enemy. And then he, then he calls him out, the devil. The devil is our enemy. We need to, we need to be woke to the schemes of the devil. We need to wake up and be alert to our adversary. Because the Bible says he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Do you realize right now the enemy is looking for someone to, de to devour? He's creeping around the church to see who's not paying attention. He's creeping around the church to see who's distracted. He's creeping around the church to see who's tempted, right? He's watching. He's watching us, right? That's why we got to stay alert. We have, to, we have to be woke. We have to know what's going on. Now, why did Paul emphasize that? And, and he spends this whole chapter. Well, actually, he spends the whole, the whole letter to the Thessal Thessalonians emphasizing the return of Jesus Christ, emphasizing that we need to be aware of what's going on. Well, the first reason he emphasizes it is we're in a spiritual warfare. When you get saved, when you get born again, you're automatically in a spiritual warfare. When you say, I'm going to stop doing whatever I was doing, I don't know what you guys were doing, but when you say, I'm going to stop it, I'm going to cut out, all the madness, all the, all the things that destroyed my life, I'm going to turn away from that and I'm going to turn my life over to Jesus. I hope everybody said that. If you're, if you're saved, you should have said that. That's what repentance is. 
And the moment you do that, you have a target on your back. That's why Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 12, he says a final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against the strategies of the devil. For we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, against evil spirits in heavenly places. Church, we are in a war. We need to be woke. We need to live our lives knowing that there is a battle going on for our soul. That the enemy is fighting for you. He's fighting for your children. He's fighting for your marriage. He's fighting for your calling. We're in a warfare. We need to realize that. You need to realize that every day, every moment of every day you need to be thinking Jesus is coming back soon so the battle is going to get more intense second reason I believe Paul emphasized this and of course he's writing about the end times is because we live in the last days we're in the last days church Our, the, the, the time of Jesus is coming the return of the Lord is very soon it's time to wake up and stop playing games because Jesus could come back today. Could come back today. And the Bible says he'll come like a thief in the night. Come on, somebody. Like that burglar that breaks in at night at nighttime and he creeps in. He waits like a thief in the night. Jesus is going to come. It'll come. The Bible says his coming will come suddenly. Suddenly, in a moment's time, blink your eyes, he's coming left. He's coming left. See, if we're not ready for Jesus, if we're not living for Jesus, we won't even realize what happened. We'll be in shock because people that we were talking to won't be there no more. Cars will be going down the street with no driver. Planes will be flying with no pilot. People that you were on the assembly line at work where you'll be working, all of a sudden they're gone. Just like that. In a moment's time, Jesus could come back. So we got to be ready. He tells us he can come soon. He could come suddenly. And we also know that his return is an inescapable. It's going to happen. Whether you believe it or not. Jesus is coming back. It's inevitable. Whether you believe it or not, whether you care or not, today, Jesus is coming back for his church. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. I like that. I like that because I'm, I'm, I'm expecting him to come back. I'm anticipating him to come back. I wish he would come back now. And thirdly, I believe Paul wrote it because it's an eternal command to the church. It's a command that was given in the early church. And it's a command that still is good for today that we need to be alert and ready. So he's speaking to us. Paul the Apostle this morning is speaking to you and I today. And he's using his God-given spiritual authority to move the church to readiness, to move the church to alertness, to move the church to where they're expecting and anticipating the return of our great Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. Are you ready? Are you ready? Matthew 24, 44, look at what it says. This is Jesus now talking to us. This is where Paul gets it from. This is where we, this is the word where we stand on. He says, therefore you also must be ready. This is Jesus telling you, he's speaking to you. You ever said, I wish God would speak to me? Well, he's speaking to you right now. He's saying, therefore you also must be ready. Watch this. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect could it be two o'clock could it be three o'clock could it be 12 o'clock could it be today could it be tomorrow we don't know 
All we know is the word of God tells us to be ready. Can I hear you say amen? That word right there that Jesus used is ready. Everybody say ready. It means in the, in, in the, in the Greek language, language, it means not to be weighed down. Not to be weighed down by pre-existing objections, pre-existing problems, or pre-existing resistance. Not to be weighed down. It means to be eager, it means to be willing, and it means to be available. See, as soldiers in the army of God, we have to be eager. We have to be excited. We have to be willing. We have to, yes, Lord, I'm, I'm waiting. I'm ready. I'm anticipating. What do you have for me to do, Lord? Just give me the command. Speak your word, and I'll do it. Can I hear you say amen? amen. Got to be ready. Got to be woke. Tell your neighbor you got to be woke. Now go back to verse 1. Let's pick up at the beginning of the chapter. Verse 1 and 2. Look at what Paul says. He says, now concerning how and when all this will happen, dear brothers and sisters, we don't really need to write you. For you know quite well that the day of the Lord's will return will come unexpectedly like a thief in the night. Paul says, you... You don't know the exact day or time. You don't know it. You don't, you don't know when it's going to happen. But he, does, but he does bring across three thoughts that we need to have. Three thoughts that we need to have. Number one, we need to be aware of what's going on today. We need to be aware of what's going on today. You, the, the, the church, the Christian, has to live life aware of what's going on. You have to be you have to be heavenly minded spiritually minded can i hear you say amen you have to be aware of what's going on because there's a lot of deception that's going to take place you have to be prepared for this you have to be prepared you have to remind yourself every day i have to be prepared i have to be ready because he could come at any time and i have to be expecting this i have to expect it i have to live my life you have to live your life in light of the return of Jesus Christ. Now let me ask you a question. If you knew Jesus was if you knew Jesus was coming back in 2 weeks. If you knew Jesus was coming back for the church in 2 weeks and I want you to be honest. Be honest. If you knew he was coming back in 2 weeks, what things would you change in your life? If you knew Jesus was coming back in two weeks, what would you change in your life? Can you think of anything? Huh? What would you change? What would you change? If you knew for sure, if, you were, if it was 100% certain, you knew Jesus Christ was coming back two weeks from the day. Not next Sunday, but the following Sunday. I bet you everybody would be in church on time. I bet you everybody would have their tithing envelopes out. I bet you people would stop cussing. I bet you uh, guys would stop checking out the sisters when they walk by. I bet you sisters would stop checking out the guys when they walk by. Come on, somebody. I bet you our worship would be a little more passionate. Come on, somebody. You'd, you'd be lifting up your hands. You'd be clapping your hands. I, I bet you, come on, I bet you at least 10 things in our life would change. Do you agree with me? Right? If you knew he was coming back in two weeks, well, we don't know. We don't know the exact hour. We don't know the exact day, but we do know he is coming back. He is coming back. Look at verse 3. Look what Paul jumps into in verse 3. When people are saying, everything is peaceful, I'm good. You know, people say, hey, man, how you doing? Come to Victory Outreach, man. Jesus loves you. He can change. Oh, no, I'm good. Right? You ever have people saying, I'm good? When people are saying everything is peaceful and secure, then disaster will fall on them as suddenly as a pregnant woman's labor pains begin. Do you know when a, when a woman's pregnant, 
She doesn't know the exact moment those labor pains are going to start. She doesn't know. Sometimes they start early. Am I right, ladies? Sometimes they start early. Sometimes they, they delay a little bit. But you don't know the exact time. All of a sudden, but you know when they happen. Come on, ladies. You know when they start. Right? And that's what, that's what Paul is saying. Disaster will fall on them as suddenly as a woman's labor pains begin. And then he says this, and there will be no escape. Now, when I read that, I started thinking, man, I got to make sure I'm ready. Because I know Jesus is coming back. The Bible tells me he's coming back. Just sometimes I think I got time to get it together. Sometimes we feel, oh, I'll get it together. I'm, you know, I got to take my time. I'm going to get it together. Or, or some of us, we say, well, I'm working on it. I'm working on it, right? Paul says, well, if you're going to work on it, he says, work on it with fear and trembling. That's the way he does, you know, fear and trembling. He says, you got to work on it like you really mean it. You got to work on it like you really believe it. You got to work on it like he's really coming back soon. He gives us some more insight here. He, he, he talks about people who aren't serving God, the lost, right? That's what really, put that verse back up. Put that verse back up. Many people are saying, he actually is pointing to the lost here. Everything is peaceful and secure. Then disaster will fall on them suddenly as a pregnant woman's labor pains has begun and there will be no end. He's not talking about you. In other words, he knows the church should know I got to be ready. He knows the believer should know I got to be alert. I got to be awake. That verse he's referring to the lost. He's referring to those who aren't serving God. And I have to believe that if you're here today, you, you're serving God or you have a desire to serve God and you want Jesus in your life. But this verse, what he's talking to, he's talking to people who feel everything is okay, and I don't need Jesus. You ever notice, every time election comes around, every politician, when they're running for election, I don't know if you're listening to them, right? They always make promises for life to get better. They always make promises, right? I remember the last two elections. They promised that the economy would get better. Didn't they? Is it better? No. Right? They promised uh, to get us out of, uh, of, of wars and different things to pull our troops out. Are our troops out of the wars? No. They're still over there fighting. Right? They, they, promised, they promised a lot of things. Right? You know, they, you know, they promised everybody here, right? They promised everybody here a stimulus check. Come on, somebody. But what they didn't tell you was your, your taxes are going to go up. They're going to get that money back from you. They make a lot of false promises. They make, when you, when, election time, they're always making promises that life is going to get better. But I, I find out that they never come through on those promises. They never come through. Do you realize the world we live in today is in a decline? The world we live in today is in a decline. It's not getting better. Realize that today. The world you live in, the world you're going to raise your children in, the world that my grandchildren are going to grow up in, it's not getting any, any better. It's going down. The world is in a decline. Four areas of decline that the world is in today. Number one, it's a moral decline. A moral decline. Man, the world's morals are so mixed up, so crazy. It's a, it's, the, immorality is at an all-time high. You can turn on your TV, you can go on your, on your cell phone today, and you can, you can view just about any type of pornography and perversion that you want to find in these things the world is in a moral decline the world is in a financial decline financially things are getting worse and worse and worse they're saying i don't know about you but i'm not worried about it because i don't operate on the world's economy but they're saying that in the next couple months you're going to notice food shortages did you know that have you, have you been to the market lately 
Sister Myra sends me to this market. Right? So I'm noticing little things like not everything you want is in the market. You can't find everything nowadays. Right? You're starting to know things are little by little. And, and I don't know if you noticed, but the prices are going up. Prices are going up. And they're doing it real, real slick. Real slick. They're making everything smaller. Have you noticed that? We bought some ice cream sandwiches. How many of you like ice cream sandwiches? Right? And when we opened up the ice cream sandwiches, they're like little, skinny. I said, I remember when they used to be, you know, so they're slick. They're just, oh, we're just raising it a little bit. Yeah, you're raising it a little bit, but I'm putting less potato chips in the bag. Or you, ever, you notice the steak, you know, you go to get a steak and it says 10 bucks. You say, well, that's not bad, 10 bucks. But if you notice the steak's little, skinny, thin, it's not, there, it's not getting any better. We're in a financial decline. That's why it's so important for the church to get on God's economy. That's why it's so important for you to become a cheerful giver. Because when you're a cheerful giver, you don't operate in the world system. You're operating in God's system. And God is going to take care of his people. My Bible tells me that. It tells me that you'll never see the righteous forsaken or their seed begging for bread. So I want to I wanna let all of our faithful, cheerful givers this morning know that you're what you're doing, you're setting yourself up for God to sustain you through whatever this world is going through. Amen? Moral decline, financial decline. And what about the climate? What about, you know, what about the climate? You're hearing some crazy, so look at the weather we've been having, right? Cold one day, hot one day, rainy one day, right? Floods in, in, in the country, we're, we're flooding in places that, you know, fires, right? It, it's a climate, the climate, the world, the world is speaking. If you're not listening to the spirit of God, if you're not listening to the word of God, listen to the world that we live in. The world is telling us that, look it, I'm about to end, right? Because the Bible says heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. We're in a, we're in a, cli a climate decline, spiritual, uh, global warming is taking place. And then lastly, the fourth one, of course, is a spiritual decline because people who used to serve the Lord with passion and with zeal now are like comfortable they're comfortable i want to encourage us here today don't get comfortable don't get complacent don't get don't get uh uh you know too too laid back in your christianity stay on fire for god when i when i first got born again they used to talk about being on fire for god how you doing i'm on fire for the lord right now you don't hear people saying they're on fire no more they're just maintaining. I'm maintaining. You got to be on fire. You got to, you, why? Because we're living in a spiritual decline. The enemy wants you to be comfortable. The enemy wants you to be complacent. The enemy wants you to kick back and take it easy. Because if you do, people's lives will be lost. The church won't be able to, the church can't advance with spiritually sleeping people. Bump your neighbor, tell them wake up. So Paul is saying, look at Paul is telling us, he's telling us it's up to the church. He's painting a picture of what the world is looking like and he's telling, he's telling the church that it's up to you, it's up to the church of Jesus Christ to let the love of God be known to this world. And in order to do that, the church has to be filled with, with people that are full of the Holy Spirit. So when we speak, the conviction of God comes upon the people we're talking to. We've got to be a praying church, right? We've got to be a praying church. That's why I loved last week. Didn't you guys love last week? Come on. Come on. How many of you, come on, be honest with me. How many of you were on the prayer meeting last week? We had, a, we had a good group of people in prayer last week. Matter of fact, we broke records of people zooming in 
to pray with us. It was powerful. We need to be a praying people. We need to be full of the Holy Spirit. Can I hear you say amen? We need to be alert. We need to be ready. We need to be woke. Tell your neighbor you got to be woke. Look at verse 8. Jump down to verse 8. We got to be a woke generation. Chapter 5, verse 8. It says like this, but let us who live in the light. Now he's talking about the church, right? Now he's talking about the church. Let us who live in the light be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love, wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. Three characteristics of an end-time believer. Number one, he says be clear-headed. Be clear-headed. What this means is we got to think right. You got to think right. He's saying you got to remain focused. Church, you got to be focused. Focus on what, Pastor Nick? Focus on God's promise and focus on God's purpose for your life. You got to be clear-headed. Peter, Peter said to gird up the loins of your mind. Paul said be renewed in the spirit of your mind. In other words, the church has to get rid of stinking thinking. Got to get rid. You got to get rid of those negative thoughts, those doubting thoughts, those, you know, those uncertain thoughts. You, you got to get anything in your mind. I like how, how he tells the Corinthians, you got to pull down strongholds. You got to cast down those imaginations. Anything that tries to exalt itself above the knowledge of God, and you got to bring it to captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Got to be clear headed. Got to think right. I got to think right. As a man or woman of God, we got to remain focused. We got we to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus Christ this morning. Think right. Because if you think right, you'll live right. If you think right, you'll live right. Clear-headed. I got to be clear-headed. You got to be clear-headed. Then he says, I got to be protected by the armor of faith. The end-time church, the end-time believer is a, is, a, is a man or woman, is a church that has the armor of faith, the protective faith. Bible says we walk by faith and not by sight. Faith is a key element. Listen, you cannot serve God without faith. You cannot, there's no way, there's no, I, I cannot do this without faith. We are called to be a people of faith. We should always, watch this, and if we're called to be a people of faith, we should always be taking steps of faith. When was the last time you stepped out and did something? You took a step of faith and you said, man, I don't know how God's going to come through, but I'm going to take a step of faith and I'm going to be obedient to his word. Remember Peter in the boat, right? Peter in the boat, Jesus called him to come. Jesus is always calling us to come. He's calling the women right now. He's saying, come to San Antonio. Come to San Antonio. Take a step of faith. Take a step of faith. I, oh, I can think of ten reasons why I can't go. But take a step of faith. Because God is calling us. He's bidding us to come. And we should always be a people that are taking steps of faith. Men, we need to take steps of faith. Come on, somebody. Church, we need to take steps of faith. He's calling, he's calling the whole Victory Outreach movement internationally. He's calling us to raise finances for the inner cities of the world. He's calling you and I together. But what holds us back sometimes is we have money or we, we don't want to let it go or we don't want to take the, the risk of going out and doing the fundraising aspect because we're, we're ashamed or afraid of what people might think of us. So we don't even post it on our, on our page. We don't have any made up a little, uh, you know, gotten a QR code or a little. We haven't even done nothing yet because we're waiting for God to just do a miracle and drop it in front of us. It don't work like that. Tell your neighbor it don't work like that. When you take steps of faith, the more I step out, the more God blesses. 
The more I surrender, the more God blesses. The more I give, the more God blesses. We've got to be a people of faith. We need, we need people of faith. We need, we need people today that you're going to, you know, you're, you're not going to, you're going to go, go on your account. You're going to see that goose egg. You say, I'm not going to, man, I'm a man of God. I'm a man of God. You're going to say, man, I'm a woman of God. I'm a child of God. There shouldn't be no zero. There shouldn't be, there shouldn't be, I shouldn't not have nothing. Man, I'm a child of the living God. God has called me by my name. Take a step of faith then. Take a step of faith and let God use you to impact the inner cities of the world. See, we, the, the end time church is a people of faith. We should be taking steps of faith often. We're, we shouldn't be dismayed. You know, you know what dismayed is? How many know what dismayed is? Dismayed is that look you gave me just a minute ago when I started talking about run for hope. It's that look you give me like. Huh? Dismayed. That's what it is. We, I'm saved. I'm a child of God. I'm a Christian, right? I believe what the word of God says. So I got to apply it to my life. I got I to gotta use it like an armor of faith. I got I to gotta, I gotta cover myself and surround myself in it. Then he says like this, thirdly, he says, wear daily as your helmet the confidence of your salvation. Here, here's where we can nail this home. Confidence of our salvation means to be fully persuaded. I'm 100% certain that Jesus died on, my, died on the cross for my sins. I'm 100% certain that Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. And I'm 100% certain that Jesus Christ is coming back for me. I'm 100%, I'm 100% certain of those things. I might not know a lot. I might, not, I, I might not be certain of a lot of things, but I'm certain of those things. I'm certain that Jesus Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I have, I have as my helmet, I put it on, the confidence of my salvation. I'm fully persuaded today that this gospel that we preach, that this word of God that we preach, I'm fully persuading that it is the truth. The gospel works. The word of God works. I'm 100% certain of that. I'm woke to that. How about you? I'm woke. Are you woke? I'm, I'm, I'm alert to that. I, I, I know that to be true. I know, I know what's going on in the world today. I'm hip to what's taking place in society today. And I'm woke today to the things of God. I know what the Bible says for my life. And I'm going to lock into it. I'm going to lock into it. Look at verse 9. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 9 through 11. Look at how Paul, he's coming to an end, but look at what he says. For God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ. Not to pour out his anger on us. Christ died for us. Somebody needs to know that. Christ died for us so that whether, watch this, so that whether we are dead or alive when he returns, we can live with him forever. Then he says, so encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. If you're here today, if you're here today and you are born again, then you need to realize today, if you're saved and you're here today, you need to realize today that you've been chosen to be an end-time believer. You've been chosen to live in this season and this time. It, this is the greatest time of the church. This is the greatest, this is the greatest time of revival for the kingdom of God. This is the this is the time. This is the we're we're living in a time that we can usher back in the the presence of God. Jesus Christ coming back for his church. We've been chosen. I've been chosen and you've been chosen to be an in time believer. We are chosen 
to be an end time church. We're chosen to be woke. We're chosen to be alert. We're chosen to be ready. The Bible says he spared us. I like that word. He spared us. He didn't have to. He spared us. I like to say Jesus didn't just save me. He rescued me. He spared us. He spared you. You're here today. You could have, in other words, you could have been dead. You could have been locked up. You could have been in some mental institution. You could have been lost. But he spared you so you could be an end-time believer. He didn't pour out his wrath on you. He, 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 he spared us so we could give our lives to the cause of Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Wake up to that. Wake up to that call upon your life today. We've been given the responsibility as an end-time church of managing God's household. You and I, unlike, unlike any other group of people, you and I are going to stand before the Lord and we're going to give an account on how we managed God's household. The end time believer, the end time church. Look at what it says, Matthew 24, verse 45 through 46. Look at what it says. It says, a faithful, sensible servant is one to whom the master can give the responsibility of managing his other household servants and feeding them. It says, if the master returns, that's talking about the end time. If the master returns, and finds that the servant has done a good job, there will be a reward. We've been given the responsibility. We, we, we've been given the responsibility. The end time church has to be faithful to the call of God upon it, upon it to fulfill the mission of the church in these last days. Then he says like this, he says, encourage each other. You know what we should be doing? We should be encouraging each other to stick it out. Encourage one another to come and join us. Encourage one another to be a part of this. Ladies, you should be encouraging one another. Come on, we need to get to San Antonio. We need to get signed up. We need to register. Even to the point where, hey, I need to find someone who can't afford to go, and I need to sponsor them to go. You know, that's something that we do often. And there's a blessing in it. But we need to encourage. That's, that's all another person mean, needs is a little word of encouragement that they could do. We church leaders, we need to encourage one another. We need to encourage our, our disciples. Yes, we could raise this funds. We could do this uh, run for hope. And we could, we could break records like never before just by encouraging. But if you're, if you're doubting, you're not speaking about it. I don't know if I'm the only one speaking about it. I don't know if, if this is the only time you hear about Run for Hope. is when Pastor Nick gets up here and says, but I know if I was a leader, if I had a life group, I would be sitting down with all my life group. I would have had a, a, a sit down with everybody and said, come on, let's get registered. Right? I, I would say, man, let's do this. We can, we can, break, we can break records. Man. We can get behind the work. All over Victory Outreach, they're doing it. People just like us, they're doing it. But let's encourage one another. Not discourage one another. Come on, somebody. If you don't say nothing, you're discouraging it. But if you promote it, if you preach it, because I'll do it. I, I, don't, I, I don't have a, you know, I don't have no shame in getting up here and telling you to give. You want to know why? You want to know why I don't have no shame? Because I know deep in my heart that if you get it and you give, God's going to bless your life. I know deep in my heart that when you become a faithful steward and you get involved in these things and, and you, you put your hand to the plow, your life is going to change. Your, your heart is going to get more receptive to the things of God. You're going to start seeing the purpose and the plan of God unfold. So I don't have no shame in saying it because I know it works. I know the gospel works. I know these, all these things that we do as a ministry. I believe in them. I believe in them. That's why I'm not ashamed to tell. I'm not ashamed to meet with the leaders. I'm not ashamed to get the print out and say, oh, come here, brother. Come here, sister. I'll do it. Why? Because I believe in this. I believe in this. 
Because that's, that's the type of church God has called us to be. A church that we're, we're on the edge. Come on, somebody. We're on the edge. We're, you know, we're not going backwards. We're going forwards. We're moving, we're moving forward with passion, with purpose, and with power. Encourage one another, he says. Build each other up, just as you are already doing. That's how Paul closes it out. I want our musicians to come, and I want you to turn real quick to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a scripture, and then we're going to pray. I believe, I believe that there's so many great things we could do as a church. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? There's so many great things that we could do if we get everybody on board, if we get everybody locked in. If all the women, all the men, all the young adults, all the students, all the, all the different ministries would just get locked in. There's nothing that we can't do. Do you believe that? I believe that with all my heart. Look at what it says. It says in verse 36, it says, however, no one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen. I don't know. Not even the angels in heaven or the son himself. Not even Jesus knows. Only the Father knows when the Son of Man will return. It will be like it was, watch this, it will be like it was in Noah's day. In those days before the flood, look at what it says, it describes it. The people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered his boat. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. That is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. Wow. You know what he just described? He described a people who were focused on themselves. He described a people who were looking for their own peace, their own joy, their own comfort, their own enjoyment. And they didn't realize in a moment's time it could all be taken with them. I remember a brother used to always say this about, about possessions, wanting things. He said, Pastor Nick, one thing I've never seen, I've never seen a U-Haul attached to a hearse you can't take it with you. You remember that story of uh, the, the guy in, uh, in Nazi Germany? I forget the name of the movie, but I know the story. The guy would sell things. He was a business owner, and he would sell stuff so he could reach more Jews and save more Jews. And he said, I could, if I, if, if I would have got rid of this watch, I could have saved 10 more Jews. If I don't just let this go, I could have reached more people. That's what Paul is talking about. He's talking about being woke, church, being alert, being ready, church. There's so much more that we could do for the kingdom of God if we just have an open-handed policy with the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to stand with me today. Stand with me all over this room today. I want to ask you a question before I open up this altar because we're going to pray for people. I want, you, I want you to think about this question here. Am I living in a way that would honor the Lord Jesus if he would return right now? Am I living in a way that would bring honor and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ if he were to return right now? Am I ready? Am I woke? Am I alert? Am I prepared to meet my Lord and Savior? You know, a lot of times we'll say I am, but I got to be honest with you. I might not be. That's why as many times as I can, I got to get to this altar. And I got to ask the Lord, Lord, prepare me. 
make me ready. God, if there's anything, any thoughts that I have, any desires that I have, any ways that I have that is not pleasing to you, that's got to become a daily prayer. If I have any sinful thoughts, if I have any sinful desires, if I have any sinful actions in my life, God, forgive me because I want to prepare myself. I want to be alert and I want to be ready for when you come back. If that's your desire today, we're going to sing a song and these altars are open right now. God bless you.